I wasn't going to say this, but uh, thank you all for praying. A week ago, we weren't here. We're here today. That's a long story short. God is good. Thank you for your tithes and your offering. Alex already said it before the factory existed years ago. Man, I would pray that I wanted, you know, to be a part of a racially diverse church. And um, I wanted to, I believe he wanted us to dig wells for people that needed water. And because of your faithfulness, uh, we're able to do that. God answers prayers. Somebody, let me say that again. God answers prayers. Somebody needs to hear that because somebody, you're stressing out, you're trying everything else, you just ought to pray. Just pray. I grew up on uh, Southern Quartet music, and uh, this morning, I got up really early, like four or something, was going over scripture, and then this song hit me. Y'all don't even know these songs. Uh, the Fantastic Violin Airs. Anybody know them? They had a song called Take the Time to Pray, and I texted that song to my brothers this morning. In my house, that's the kind of music that we listen to, and now I'm 52, and that song ministers to me. Keith, don't just hurry to get to church. Slow down and pray. So parents, when your kids don't want to listen to that music you're playing, you never know. At 52, it might minister to them. Turn off little Yachty and big Yachty and medium sized Yachty. <laughs> We're in Galatians. We're actually going to be in 1 Corinthians 13, but the scripture or the sermon series that we're in is taken from Galatians 5 22 and 23. Go ahead and put it on the screen. You've heard these verses, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. These are the fruit of the Spirit that's in Scripture. Long story short, for the next few weeks, we're going to be going over these fruit. Why? because I want us to bear these fruit. Well, let me take that back. God wants us to bear these fruit. So the fruit that we're going to talk about today is love. Love. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you. I thank you for my wife. crazy that when you knit her together, you probably even had me in mind. So thank you. All good gifts come from above. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. So I thank you. I thank you. Father, what we want today is for you to be glorified. I'm confident that if I stay in this book, that can happen. So, what I want then is to decrease. May you increase. Holy Spirit, please do what I cannot do. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. This week, I heard music from two artists and the songs just made me sad, just made me sad. You ought to listen to what your kids listen to. These artists happen to be ladies and the blatant casual references to how they would use their bodies dismayed me. There was absolutely no mention of love. It was beyond veiled sexual innuendo. It was crass. It was unapologetic. Before somebody emails me, let me tell you that my intention is not to castigate secular artists or women. So don't, don't. 
because I, I realize, man, we're at the forefront of this debauchery. We're at the forefront of objectifying and, and misusing sex. I, I, I get that. I thought about these two songs this week, and I realized I'm old. I'm an old man. And old people, we have a tendency to glorify our era. Because I thought all week, now when I was growing up, on that thing, you remember we had this thing called the radio? Y'all remember the radio? <laughs> on the radio, we heard songs about love. My boy Lionel Richie with the shag haircut. You remember it was long in the back. He, he, he said, you're once, twice, three times a lady. And what did he say? I love you. He, he, he said love. He wasn't talking about, I can't, get, I can't even say what I want to say. Uh, the greatest love song ever, in my opinion, always and forever, each moment with you. And at the end, he says, I'll always love you for how long? Forever. We, 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 we had those kind of songs. Dolly Parton and Whitney Houston said, I will always do what? Love you. <laughs> Elvis Presley. When I was a kid, Elvis was the man. He invented rock and roll. I'm joking. <laughs> and he said, he said, he said, uh, I can't help falling in love with you. I remember the first time I met Lucille, she walked up to me and she said that to me. <laughs> remember? I was like, girl, give me some space. <laughs> when I was in elementary school, I had a mad crush in elementary school on Natalie Cole. And Natalie Cole said, I love will stand tall as the tree. I remember. <laughs> I failed to realize, though, that we didn't just get to today's brand of music overnight. Because my boy Marvin Gaye said, let's get it. Because <laughs> I need me some sexual healing. Y'all remember? There was a band named Def Leppard. They say, pull some sugar. <laughs> Those songs were not made yesterday. Many of the songs that even talked about love, as I thought about it, they weren't as classy as I envisioned. Earth, Wind, and Fire, Philip Bailey had a hit. Reasons, reasons that we're here. It was about a one-night stand. You didn't know that, did you? <laughs> it was about hooking up with a little side piece. Midnight Star. Y'all remember Midnight Star? They had all of those love songs, but they said, Secret Love Us. And they made cheating on your spouse sound good. Wow. Seems like everybody has sung about love. My man Elvis, uh, Whitney Houston, Michael Jackson, Madonna Taylor Swift, Tupac, uh, LL Cool J said, I need love. So what's insidiously transpired is this. They've miseducated us on love. We even see the miseducation of the church. Paul had to write about love to the church. <laughs> Fortunately, in spite of our miseducation, I got good news. Want to hit? Yeah. Here it go. <laughs> the Bible.
Bible has something to say about love. It's good news. Because we're never going to get worship right if we don't get love right. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul gives us, if not a treatise, he gives us at least a hymn that focuses on love. The distinguishing word of Christianity is love. As a matter of fact, Paul uses the word agape 10 times, proving the Bible has something to say about love. First thing that I see that it says, number one, it's mandatory. Love is mandatory. Love is mandatory. It's, it's, it's in the first three verses. Paul says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding breasts or a clanging cymbal. The church world, we love eloquent orators. We love people that can speak. Boy, we will pack out uh, stadiums to go see a good preacher. And a good preacher is somebody that we think can throw down. We don't really know how to analyze it. We love good speakers in church or in otherwise. Paul says, if I speak well, uh, but I ain't got no love, the sound is good, but ain't no soul there. Verse 2, it says, though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove Kennesaw stone, <laughs> But I have not love. I'm, I'm zero, zero, zero. I'm nothing. He's not talking here when he talks about faith. He's not talking about saving faith here. He's talking about that special ability to trust and believe God to do great miracles. He says in verse 3, and though I bestow all, all my goods to feed the poor. I'm not just writing a little bit of check. I'm giving up everything. And though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love is necessary. Love is a must. But often the church puts the cart before the horse by placing gifts before love. Uh, by placing skills and abilities before love. Paul knew this, so he wrote this text. Write this down. Church folk have a tendency to pursue the extraordinary versus the essential. He said, tons of men and angels. Come on, tons of men and angels. That's a big deal. If I got up here and preached with tons of men and of angels, it would blow y'all away. But if I ain't got love, who cares? He, 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 he says, prophetic power. That's big deal to church people. Understanding all mysteries and all knowledge. If I showed you mountain moving faith, that would impress you. If I fed the poor and I sacrificed my body. Here's the thing. Impressive stuff like that gets church folk hyped. Here's the problem. It's not on the screen, but I would write this down. Impressiveness can conceal fruitlessness. <laughs> I'm going to say that again. I'm reading a book now on leadership, and uh, I've read it before, and I laughed when I read it before. It was a sign to me when I was getting my degree. And I was laughing, I was highlighting, I disagreed with the book. I'm going to do a whole series on leading. I disagree with how we do leadership. Some of y'all ain't going to like the series, that's what I'm here for. Uh, and, and I'm reading the book and I'm highlighting these leaders that they're highlighting in the book. This book was written years ago, all of them have fallen. It ain't because they're bad men. We do leadership wrong. We get enamored with gifts. We get enamored with upfront. We let ah, uh, we let people kiss our butts. I'm not God. My name is Keith. <laughs> Look, she'll tell you I'm not God. I'm not. I'm not God. We gotta do leadership. Well, we got one leader, uh, and you can't be impressed with if somebody can sing or or if they can speak. It's just what God has given me to do. Do I love y'all?
You can be busy doing, 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 but be devoid of love. <laughs> Again, I texted my brothers this morning. One of my brothers is dead now. We text all the time. My oldest brother that died a year and a half ago, he took us to, he lived in Greenwood, South Carolina. This is the brother that pulled up to the church picnic. And uh, he, he had us in his hometown and he bought us snacks. We, he was a lot older than us, potato chips and soft drinks. And we're in like the back of his uh, Grand Prix. And my brother Kenny, I think it was, I might have this detail wrong. He had a soft drink and potato chips. He opened his bag of potato chips, true story, and there was one potato chip in the bag. The bag looked good, but it was full of air. <laughs> I'm gone. Love you guys. Let me say it one more time. The bag had lays on it but it deceived my brother Ken. And when he opened the bag, I was like, oh, I got chips in mine. You got one chip. It's air. It's air in your bag. One, Paul wants us to know one can be impressive, but empty. <laughs> one can be known on the outside, but have nothing on the inside. One can be popular in Christian's eyes, but not be powerful in God. Why, why is that? Why is that? Write this down. God doesn't look to see if you evoke emotions in people. He looks to see if you edify them. Can I be honest with you? You can always pray for me when you don't see me here on Sunday. Normally I'm preaching somewhere. Here's my tendency. I know typically what church is like. They don't know what I can just bring, you know, one of my top sermons. So they'll like me. So they'll clap for me. Every now and then you get standing olds at churches. No, do what God tells you to do. Because God ain't interested in if I make y'all emotional. God ain't interested in if you amen me, if you lifting your hands to me. He ain't interested. He wants to know, am I feeding you? Anybody here got some extraordinary gifts, but you're missing the essential? Anybody? Anybody here, you got, some, you got some gifts, you got some abilities, you got some talents. Uh, people call you sir and ma'am at work, but you devoid of love. Anybody? You, you may sing like a bluebird or a red bird or Patti LaBelle or Luther Vandross, but do you have what's mandatory? Love. The Bible has something to say about love. Because <laughs> if we're going to do worship right, we're going to have to do love right. The second thing the Bible has to say in this passage is it's monitorable. I don't know if that's a word, but stick with me. <laughs> it's monitorable. In other words, you can, you can see love in action. So, so this is free here. Don't just listen to what people tell you because you can see love. Any, any, anybody in here, you ever talked a lie game and you disguised it as a love game? <laughs> yeah, love has some attributes. Love clearly has some do's and some don'ts. It, it's, it, it's clear. Long before I met you, when I was a little boy in Elberton, this is just how I thought. <laughs> I, uh, I knew that there was a look that I wanted. When I, when I drank my milk and I grew up and I became a man, <laughs> I was like, there's a certain kind of look that I, you know, I got to have. Okay, yeah, I like church people because y'all didn't do this. Y'all prayed for y'all's mate. When y'all was 14, Lord. No, I was shallow with mine. Uh, there was a look I wanted. <laughs> Here's the pleasant surprise. <laughs> My wife exceeded the look. <laughs> he, 
most of us have an image, a vision of what love looks like to us. It tends to be romantic. Paul is focusing on love between church folk, <laughs> love between brothers and sisters, uh, not somebody you're dating or have an affinity towards. Got to get that. We, the church, don't have much of a vision about that kind of love. Hope y'all hear me. That's why he had to write the chapter, because R. Kelly been teaching us about love. Real talk. <laughs> Babyface, Elton John, Diana Ross, you name it. Uh, uh, and, so, and so what Paul, the good news is, there's a pleasant surprise. What he teaches about love far exceeds what Babyface got to say. It far exceeds what Whitney Houston had to say. Why? Because it's in the text. Here's why it exceeds. Number one, love suffers long. <laughs> and it's kind. Uh, in other words, love is patient. In other words, love can put up with evil. Love can put up with some hell. Uh, are you quick to repay someone for an offense against you? Are you quick? Somebody does it to me, I'm going to do it to them. Listen to me. That's not love. You're quick to repay. Meanwhile, God has been slow to judge your behind. <laughs> you should have been dead. But, but, but love suffers long. God suffered long. You should have been counseled. You should have been exposed. But God and his love suffered long. And he ain't embarrassed you. We don't know your crap. Do you suffer long? Do you put up with hell? Or do you quickly write people off? Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. So in other words, you can possess incomparable gifts and skills, and you won't be talking about it. You want everybody don't have to know that you got it like that, which you probably don't. <laughs> Verse 5, it does not behave rudely, does not seek its own. By the way, we're living in a weird, weird, rude world. Everybody's rude. Everybody is rude. Everybody's rude. Church folks are even rude. But, but that's not love. It doesn't behave rude. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It thinks no evil. If you hang with me, you're going to see something. I love talking sports. Before the game the other night, me and this dude at the church, we were texting. I was like, Boston going to beat Golden State in five. If Marcus Smart don't think he Jason Tatum, we going to win. I love talking sports, and inevitably when, <laughs> inevitably, when you talk sports, you got to talk about the record books, Travis. You got to talk. If you and I sit down long, we're going to talk about the GOAT, and you ain't going to want to talk about LeBron. I know you. You don't want to will. I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> but you inevitably talk about the record books. And, and, and the problem with some of us, we have a different type of record book where we keep all the records of wrongs that a person has committed against us. <laughs> Is there anybody here, you spend a significant amount of time literally meditating on what your ex did to you? What your once upon a time ride or die friend to you, you literally meditate on church herbs. Man, I'm tired of people coming to me talking about church hurt. Get over it. Your boss treats you like crap. You go back. You meditate on it. It consumes you. But love is not like that. Love knows the evil that's there, but it extends itself anyway. It knows you're a liar, but it still extends itself. It knows you're a cheater, but it still extends itself. It's know that I read this morning, Joshua was talking to the people. He gave them the law. He told them what's up. He said, uh, y'all better serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. The people's like, we can do this. We got this. We got this. Joshua said, y'all can't. Y'all can't do it. And if you read the Bible, they prove they can't. But guess what you see? Chapter after chapter after chapter, love shows up. They worship in a golden cow. Love shows up. They don't believe anymore. Love shows up. Why? Because that's love. You can see that kind of love. Hmm. 
verse 6, it doesn't rejoice in iniquity. I wish I could stay there because we live in a world, the songs that I heard this week, we listen to that stuff, it don't even bother us. We dance to it. That ain't love. Love doesn't rejoice in iniquity. We don't care about sin anymore. That's quiet. It doesn't rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices. Listen to this. Check this out. In the truth. In the truth. Pseudo love will compromise the truth. How does it do that? By glossing over unrighteousness. Uh, Fake love tells people what they want to hear. That's what fake love does. Fake love won't go in your bedroom. I've heard preachers say that. I I ain't going in people's bedroom. If I know you sitting in your bedroom, I'm preaching about it. It's fake love. We won't say anything about injustice. We can see injustice, but fake love will keep its mouth closed. I'm not sure if you noticed what I noticed. We live in a world then of fake love. Where we just compromise the truth and we gloss over sin. Verse 7, love bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things. In other words, love is this, love will take pain and hush. (laughs) Love will take being mistreated and be quiet about it. It ain't got to tweet about how they treated me. Oh, oh, they lied. No, no, no. Love will take it. Love endures quietly. Anybody ever taken advantage of love? I have. But did it ever leave you? No, 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 no. Here's what verse 8 says. Love never fails. Y'all are too quiet for me. Uh, let me, can I say that one more time? Love never fails. The reason that that's not a place to be quiet, that's a place to shout, because the only reason you're here, because love didn't fail you. <laughs> In other words, you can count on what? Love. It's never going to fail. In the good times and the bad times, love is not going to fail. Friends can leave you. Family can forsake you, for, for, forsake you but love will do neither. In other words, this kind of love is monitorable. It can be seen. It can be detected. I don't know if you know this verses 4 through 8. Love has a profile. It has a profile. Write it down. Love has a profile that's not characterized by feelings, but by commitment. So, uh, I know that this chapter isn't talking about romantic love. If you're dating somebody and all they give you is feelings, all you give them is feelings, you might want to check. That might not be love. Is there a commitment? Is there a commitment? Is there a commitment? Uh, did you read verses 8 through 8, uh, uh, 4 through 8? You cannot depend on feelings to do these things. You cannot do it. If you depend on feelings, you're not going to suffer long. You're not going to be kind when somebody forces you to be patient. You're going to snap on a fool. If you try to do these things, your feelings, they will do the opposite of what these verses tell you to do. Your feelings will make you envy. Your feelings will make you boast. They will make you puff up and parade yourself. Your feelings, they'll provoke you to think about evil rather than truth. And you will judge people unwarranted based on your feelings. If you depend on your feelings, you're going to rejoice in sinfulness rather than the truth. Why? Because everybody else is doing it. Everybody else is going along with it. I might as well approve. I don't want to be viewed as a judgmental Christian. I'll go along to get along. If you depend on your feelings, you're not going to bear all things. You're not going to believe all things. You're not going to hope all things. Shoot, you won't even endure some things, some little things. You won't do it. You will quit without love. I hope y'all hear me. Without love, 
you will quit. I've told you this before we started this church. People that laughed with us, smiled with us, said, we're going to help you plant this church. Good people, by the way. I don't want, hey, Madam. I said, they're going to quit because you got to love this. You got to love it when things are bad. You got to love it when I ain't know. You remember when we didn't know how we were going to eat, when we didn't know how money was going to come in. You got to love what you're doing when ain't nobody clapping for you, when you're sitting home alone. You got to, verses four through eight. And here's the thing, when you have it, people can see it. If you depend on your feelings, you'll only love people you think deserve to be loved. Let me give the homework assignment. Here, here's what I want you to do. I want you to do a self-examination, just a self-examination. Answer this question. Am I giving the 1 Corinthians 13 type of love? I was going to ask, are you receiving it? But focus on giving it first. I don't see y'all writing, but that's okay. Are you giving it? Are you giving it? The Bible has something to say about love. Because <laughs> if we're going to do worship right, we got to do love right. The third thing it has to say, it's matchless. It's matchless. It's incomparable. <laughs> love has no peer, Greg. Love has no rival. It has no equal. Uh, love is in a class by itself. It, it, it's the rest of the verses. Love, I've already read it, it never fails. I could end right there. That, that puts it in a class by itself. It never, ever fails. I'm a huge Jason Tatum fan. I'm going to try not to talk about sports anymore. I'm a huge fan. But sometimes, man, he be disappointing me. You got to get the ball in the fourth. You got to tell Marcus Smart, you go in the corner. Everybody else get out. You give me the ball. Sometimes, sometimes Jason Tatum fails. Sometimes Kobe Bryant fails. Sometimes Michael Jordan fails. My Bible tells me love. But whether there are prophecies, these are big deal gifts. They will what? Fail. Whether there are tongues, they will what? Cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will what? Vanish away. Anybody not as smart as you used to be? You don't even know where your keys at, anybody? <laughs> uh, for we know in part. We know in part and we prophesy in part. We know in part. Some of us in smaller parts than other folks. And we prophesy in part, but when, I love this verse, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. Ah, here's what I love about love. There's no expiration nor limitation with love. <laughs> There's no expiration or no limitation. It ain't gonna run out. Ain't no expiration date on it. No limitation. Uh, ain't no mountain high enough. Ain't no river. No limitations. It can get over a mountain. It can get under a valley. It, love, nothing can stop it. Nothing. Love is matchless. I love verse 10. He says, when that which is perfect is come, the coming of perfection he's talking about, that coincides with what? Meeting Christ in person. When Christ returns, there'll be no need for prophecy. When Christ returns, there'll be no need for speaking in tongues or the knowledge of the church that the world has gained. But you know what's still going to be here? Love. Love is still going to be here. Making it what? Matchless. He said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. The other gifts, the other gifts are so limited by the constraints of this life. What Paul does is he, he exposes their partial nature and, and he compares them to childlike things. Uh, a mature adult, a mature adult wouldn't resort to childlike immaturity. 
So it's unimaginable then that these gifts, the other gifts, will endure beyond their usefulness in eternity. It's key. So let me break it down this way. It's great to want these other gifts, but do you love? Because I ain't going to be preaching in heaven. Y'all ain't going to want to hear me. Some of you don't want to hear me now. But I ain't going to have to write another sermon. Because the sermon is right in front of us. <laughs> Paul says in verse 12, for, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Y'all don't know when to show, man. <laughs> now we know in part. Then I shall know just as I also am known. He said, now basically we see in like a dimly lit mirror. In a mirror, in a mirror, a mirror that ain't so great. This is my wife's big phone. This thing is huge. A few years ago, my wife and I took our daughter to college. Her first two years were at Arizona State. Uh, she was there for two years. We dropped her off. We were with her all day, helped her unpack, and we just kind of prolonged the day. Just unpacking as slow as you can. And then I messed up and told her, I said, you're the best daughter God could have ever given. Shouldn't have done that. <laughs> and then when we left her that night in her apartment, my daughter, my first child, we left her. We tried to walk to the car. My wife almost collapsed. I had to hold her up. Crying, man. Then we get to the hotel in Arizona. My wife finally gets to sleep. And once she got to sleep, I tipped out of bed. I went and got in the shower. <laughs> yeah, man. I waited till she had to go to sleep. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and boy, <laughs> And I'm not joking. I was crying like that. <laughs> now, I didn't drop my daughter off at jail. I didn't drop her off at prison. She was at college. But <laughs> I was crying. I was crying. And for two or three weeks, at least afterwards, in our house, even our dog was sad. Not joking. He would sit at the door and wait for my daughter. Like my daughter ever bought him dog food, ever bought him a bed, ever. So what I would do, hallelujah, I would take my phone out and I would look at her pictures. Yeah. But how many of you know a picture is not the real thing? So I was still crying, Carol, because she still ain't here. That's what Paul is trying to say. Paul is saying, because y'all know Corinth, they, one of the things they were known for, they had good mirrors. I know that seems small. That's probably why Paul used this. Paul is kind of saying, even though y'all make good mirrors, ain't nothing like the real thing. Uh, the first time, <laughs> the first time Jayla came home and came to the airport, I got in a Mercedes coupe. I, I mean, I mean, uh, the Nissan. <laughs> And I, I rolled down to the airport. My wife and I rolled to the airport. And Jayla came down the sidewalk with her bag. My daughter, man, coming out, making some out of herself. She like our JJ. She going to get us out the hood. <laughs> and when Jayla showed up, I didn't do this. I didn't run up to her and said, hold on, hold on, Jayla. Uh, wait a minute. Let me get my phone out. I want to look at some of your pictures. I didn't say that. No, because I had the real thing. Uh, we will know God. That's what Paul wants us to know. We're going to know God intimately in person. Where? In heaven. One day we're going to see him how? Face to face in heaven. Everything of which the gifts now speak, they're going to be done away with in heaven. Everything that prophecy talks about is going to be revealed in heaven. Everything that tongues talks about is going to be revealed in heaven. We will will not need these gifts in heaven because Jesus is going to be there when that which is perfect comes. Who is the perfect one? Jesus. Stop getting fake pictures from R&B. 
Stop getting fake pictures of love from movies. Verse 13, I'm almost about to land the plane. It's bad that y'all laugh when I say that. <laughs> Verse 13 says, and now. And now. Can I stop real quick, though? Paul ain't talking about time. He's talking about opposition. <laughs> what do I mean? He, he, he's juxtaposing love with the other gifts. I've been talking about tongues. I've been talking about prophecy. I've been talking about faith to move mountains. And now. He ain't talking about time. I, I'm, 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 I'm opposing love against these other things. It's not that he's against the other gifts. He just knows they ain't love. He ain't mad about tongues. He just knows tongues ain't love. He ain't mad about prophecy. He just knows prophecy ain't love. So he's making them in opposition to love. He, he said, now about faith, hope, love, these things, but the greatest of these is love. Love is matchless. He, he says, now about what? Faith. He ain't talking about the type of faith he was talking about in the prior verse that moved mountains. He's talking about saving faith. So this is a big deal. And, and, and then he says, hope. He's talking about the, now the glories of salvation. He's talking about, hey, we'll be able to look ahead. We're going to have a bodily resurrection. That's a part of our hope. And then he talks about love. I don't know if you see what I see. All three of these last gifts, these are salvific gifts. Uh, you need faith to get saved. You better have some hope to get saved. Uh, and you need love to get saved. But out of all of these, ain't none of them touching. Faith doesn't touch love. Why, why, why? Because one day faith is going to be superseded. When? When the end comes. One day hope is going to be superseded. When? When the end comes. But when the end comes, nothing is going to supersede love. When we get to heaven, love is still going to be there. When we see Jesus face to face, love is still going to be there. When we walk streets of gold and look around at walls of Jasper, love is still going to be there. Why? It's matchless. Think about what he said in verse 8. You can come play, man. Sir, didn't mean to say man. Think about what he said in verse 8. Love never fails. I've been in church my whole life. Here's what worries me about me, so it probably should worry me for you too. I read verses like that. And I just read off him because I've read this verse. How many times have I read love, love never fails? Did y'all hear what I just said? Love never fails. <laughs> Again, I'm going to say that one more time because us church folk, we've heard this too much. We hear about grace so much, it don't mean anything anymore. Let me say this one more time. Love never fails. So in other words, Paul is teaching about something like we ain't never experienced before. We've never experienced anything like this. You can get a high-end luxury car, pay a ton of money for it, but you keep it long enough, something on that car is going to fail. Uh, you can get a seven-bedroom, five-bathroom estate in Alpharetta uh, in the cul-de-sac up on a hill with a lake in front, but you keep that house long enough, eventually something in that house is going to fail. I have voted for people in office confident that they would do right only to see them Fail. I have turned on the TV and watched preachers preach that I thought were amazing only to see those same preachers fail. Paul says this. Here's what he's saying in my vernacular. Here's what he's saying. He's saying love hit different. <laughs> what is he? What did he just say? Uh, love hit different. Love hits different. It hit different. Love never fails. Why? I can tell you why. If you turn to put it up on the screen, if you turn to 1 John 4, 8, here's why love never fails. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. God is love. 
Y'all missed it. <laughs> uh, that's why love never fails, because God is love. No wonder love can't fail, because love is God, and, and God doesn't know how to fail. God doesn't know how to fall apart. God doesn't know how to tear into pieces. God doesn't know how to break down. God don't need to be plugged in an outlet. God don't need Wi-Fi. God is God, and he will never, ever fail. You don't need to take out a warranty on God. You don't need a money back guarantee. I'm going to say something. This ain't in the sermon, but when I wanted to plant a church, I ain't have a dime. I was singing at a mega church. I won't say where, and I didn't know anybody. Somebody invited me to sing backstage. The pastor found me. I'd never seen the pastor. I ain't have any money. I'm trying to plant a church. The pastor says, I hear you're trying to plant a church. I want you to be one of our residents, church planting residents. I'm going to take you to lunch, and we're going to talk. I want to train you. Now, can I say this? I ain't really trust that pastor, just being real, <laughs> being honest with you. I didn't say that. He took me to lunch. He invited me to be one of their residents, and and. Everybody kissed up to him. And we're in one of his trainings, and he's giving us all of his supposed knowledge. And he's talking about what they do at their church because they're mad good, and we should be taking notes. I ain't never been interested in being mad good. I want to be biblical. Let me go over here. Let me go over here. I'll go over here. <laughs> so, so, so he's saying what we do because, you know, we want y'all to give money. That's what preachers be wanting. Y'all, did y'all know that? Y'all better listen to me. <laughs> so he said, what we do at our church to get people to do tithes and offering, we do money back guarantees. Oh, yeah, I've heard this. Y'all never heard it? 90 day money back. Oh. <laughs> Don't ever go to a church that does that. So he said, what we do is we guarantee that at the end of 90 days, if God hadn't been good to you, come through for you, you can get your money back. I didn't ask to be there. I didn't really want to be there. So I ain't going to say anything. I just want to leave. I just want to leave. And then we take a break, and he says, anybody got anything to say? And he really wanted us complimenting him. I ain't got nothing to say because I know if I say something, he ain't going to like it. So nobody would say anything, and he's pushing us to say anything. I said, hey, I disagree with what you just said. I dis and then every face gets red. But I've, I've already said it. And it needed to be said. Because you said you will give money back if God don't come through. If God, hallelujah, if God fails in 90 days. I said, here's what I know. Whether you get money or not, God can't fail. <laughs> so you tripping. You tripping, bro. I don't want to come to this church. I don't want you to be my boss. I don't want you to be my mentor. Because I got a God who doesn't fail. Even when times get rough. There are times that it looks like he's failing. There's times that he will hide himself. But God doesn't know how to fail. Are you kidding me? You will never get a money back guarantee here. If your life looks bad, it ain't because God is failing. If you lose your job, it ain't because God is failing. If your spouse leaves you, it ain't because God is failing. Anybody love him? Thank you, Lord. Songs, songs are not the primary reason for our miseducation regarding love. That ain't why we're primarily miseducated. The reason we're primarily miseducated is because we don't get the word. We don't read it. Some of you here, you haven't read the word. You don't know when you've read it last. Let me say to you, that can't be acceptable. I'm not trying to fuss. I want us to grow. It cannot be acceptable. Some of us, man, we don't abide in the word. We don't just eat it. Man, you should love. I was praying this morning. Sometimes I don't like to pray. Sometimes I'm tired. And then it hit me. Hold on. I get to talk to God? And I don't like it. You got to study it. You got to sit in this word. Sit in it. Sit in it. Eat it. Eat it. Because it has something to say about love. And honestly, about whatever else it is you need. 
We're about to take communion. And as soon as service is over, I know we don't have armor bearers here, but somebody bring me a fan. <laughs> Hot. Hey, ain't no need of talking about giving love if you haven't received the greatest love. God is love, but we do know Jesus is God. He's love. And, 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 and there's no love like this. What manner of love that he would lay down his life for friends, for people like us. And, 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 and so what I want us to do is I want us to think about the love he has given. Have you received it? Have you said yes to that kind of love? You, do you know what kind of love it is? It's the kind of love, Miss Joanne, that got beat down. You, 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 you believed it the other week. You gave your life to the Lord the other day. You said yes to love. The kind of love that, that took a whip, took a beat. That kind of love where nails were driven through his hands, a stake through his feet. That's the kind of love we're talking about. A kind of love that would have crowns placed down and pushed down on his head, and he would take it. That's the kind of love we're talking about. The kind of love that would be spat upon. That's the kind of love we're talking about. A kind of love that would step in as a perfect substitute, would step in as a perfect sacrifice and die on a tree, a shameful death. But on third day, he, he rose again. And he's coming back again. And when we go back with him, guess what's going to be where we're going? Love. Love. Do you love him in return? Anybody here, you've never said yes to him being your savior? Could this be your day? Would you make this your day? You want to make him your savior today? Can I see your hand? I'll gladly pray for you. You want to make him your savior today? Not just come to church, but you want him to be your savior. Would you lift your hand? Then those of us that are already saved, you do not want to partake of the elements playing around. <clears throat> New Testament God, still a God of wrath. Don't play with him. <laughs> so if you got sin in your life, you wouldn't be the first. Now is simply the time to bow your heads. Let's just all do that and kind of get yourself right with God. If you got stuff that you need to confess, if you got things that you need to turn away from, let's take this time now to do it. We're not going to rush, so if you're in a hurry, sorry. They hung and hung, stretched and wide, <clears throat> hung his head. going to do it today. What I want us to do is think about his love. As you think about his body, that's love. Knowing that you're going to bring your body from heaven to earth to be born in a stinking, smelling manger, that's love. That same body is going to be beaten, bruised, wounded. That body is, is going to suffer brutally. I'm talking brutality. That's love. And so as we get ready to partake, let's just thank him for giving his body. We thank you, Lord. Let's partake. That's 
God's love. When they beat his body, I thought about it this morning. I talk about this stuff every week. <laughs> but man, that had to be a crazy beat down. Because I've been beat up before, but he was bleeding profusely. He didn't just get a casual beat up. They beat him until he bled. Y'all hear me? They whipped him over. I'm not talking for a couple of minutes. They made fun of him. He was sport to them. But they don't realize <laughs> they were a part of God's providence. They were a part of the story because because it ain't good enough for him just to be beaten. He needs to bleed. <laughs> because without the shedding of blood, <laughs> we wouldn't be here. We couldn't get forgiven. I'm glad he bled. And I don't mean that in a, in a, in a, in a way that's flippant. No, no, no. They don't know you're participating in his redemption plan. He's got to bleed. Hallelujah. And so as we think of just this, what's in this cup, no, 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 see beyond this and realize he bled for me. And without the shedding of his blood, no remission of sin. But we sit here today because he did bleed. Let's thank him and let's drink. Father, we thank you. Hmm. Father, we thank you. We thank you. That your love, I don't need Elvis Presley's version. I don't need Whitney Houston's version. I, I don't need Hollywood's version. I don't even need other church folks' version. I just need to look at you. God, your love. And we thank you that when, 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 when we were yet sinners, you commended your what? Your love towards us. We didn't earn it. We didn't tap dance it. We didn't memorize Bible verses for it. You just know how to love. Why? Because you are love. And so as a church, we say hallelujah. We say hallelujah. We say hallelujah to you. Hallelujah to you. Hallelujah to you. Hallelujah to you. We thank you. We thank you. Now help us to go out and show people your love, even people we don't think deserve it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. When we planted the church every single Sunday, the person that did the announcement would say this, what you going to do? What you're going to do? And that's the question we need to keep asking. What are you going to do the other six days? What are you going to do Monday, Tuesday to show people God's love? I dare somebody to open up their mouth. Don't tell folks about the factory, but tell people about Jesus Christ. What you're going to do? Tell somebody about him. Have a great week. God bless you. They hung him high, stretched him wide.